Hello and welcome. Thank you for tuning in to this month's Community Venue Learning Series. For those of you who are new here, these are our free monthly webinars, which hope to assist, inspire, empower, and equip all those who work for community venues to do their work more effectively, efficiently, or just to learn a new skill and get new ideas for your work. Or if you're somebody who was scrolling through and found this month's topic intriguing, but don't work in a community venue, then you are also welcome here. For those of you who are watching this recording after this live event, hello, and we hope you get valuable knowledge from this session. My name is Carmela, and I organize these monthly learning series. Alongside this, I am also in the marketing team and head the social media for Space to Go. Just a little bit about Space to Go before we move on. Our mission in Space to Go is to help community venues to be a thriving hub in their communities by being able to provide and give them opportunities to grow bookings, increase community engagement, as well as support. This is why we started this learning series, among other things. We also create and provide free resources to be able to do exactly that. Spaceco is a two-sided marketplace where you can list your spaces where guests can find them online and book your spaces, but it is also an efficient booking system tool where you can reduce your admin by 80%. We work with a number of local governments as well as community centers across Australia and New Zealand. So for this month's Community Renew Learning Series, we will be hearing from one of Space Coast's very own hosts from Auckland, New Zealand. This community venue has undergone the journey to being zero waste venue. So we look forward to hearing from their journey as we learn as well the challenges they faced and how they navigated around that. We'll also hear some practical tips and tricks to inspire you to get started. So Richard Green is an arts practitioner and the executive director for the Waka Eke Noa Charitable Trust, um, which facilitates Kete Aranui and the Factory Theater and the Ugly Shakespeare Company. Initially training as a journalist, Richard acted in over 100 productions in Aotearoa and the United States by the time that he was 23 and directed several shows. His career moved towards theater education, then towards film and freelance as a director. He has had many accomplishments and his experiences over the years culminates in over 30 years, practical experience in the arts and arts governance, which Richard cur Richard's current and continuing role as the executive director. So we welcome to the floor, Richard. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, for those of you from Australia, that means hi everybody <laughs> in Te Māori. I'm Richard Green uh, and um, welcome to this session. I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey of what we've done. Um, this is not uh, always a successful um, thing with people, trying to re-educate people around zero waste. Uh, it's a journey that takes a long time. I've just been looking at some of the questions and some of you talking about how do you educate people with the policies you've already got in place and that's something I'll be touching on, but I'll give you a little bit of background. Our venue um, is in, in a um, part of Auckland City called Onihunga, and we have five rehearsal rooms um, that are used for dance, theatre, music, um, various sizes, and also we run a theatre out of that as well, a performance space with a foyer. When we first set this up in 2019, our, um, our charitable trust, Hewaka Akinoa Charitable Trust, which means a canoe on which anyone may embark, and is focused on arts access. Um, we won the Sustainability Award for Small Businesses for the Sustainability Council in 2011 um, around our practices of sustainability. And we've pretty much taken that kaupapa or philosophy with us all the way through. And um, when we um, decided to start a venue, that was always gonna be in the mix for that. Now, this has been a long journey for us because in the city of Auckland, there's very little space for rehearsals and things like that. So we um, have been working, we've been working about 10 years on this before we even opened just to get the spaces that we had. And we um, fortunately fell upon the building that we now occupy here in Onihunga. The first part of our development was um, we, the building that we occupy has three floors to it. The bottom floor had um, classrooms in it. The middle floor had a church occupying it and the top floor was office space and kitchens and, and those sorts of things. So we, um, when we came in here in June 2019, the one thing that we really wanted to make sure happened is that we didn't have to employ staff members to be on call all the time because 
the whole focus of our operation was to make art spaces accessible for um, for arts practitioners who uh, couldn't find space, couldn't afford space, were rehearsing in grandma's living room and that sort of stuff. And part of the thing we identified with that is if we didn't have to have people cleaning all the time, managing people's waste and those sorts of things, it would be an easier way to facilitate a 24 seven access space. So we found a locking system that um, uh, sometimes worked <laughs> that works now very well, um, which is 24 seven, we can send an independent code to people. And part of that was that we told people that, um, for those of you not in New Zealand, the Department of Conservation uh, here, which runs a lot of campsites, has a philosophy around what you take in, you take out again. And I grew up doing a lot of um, tramping here in New Zealand, Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so I kind of wanted to bring that philosophy into our venue. So we didn't provide, first of all, in the rehearsal rooms, we didn't provide any bins. Uh, that was our first step. So, and we would, we had signage up, which I'll show the signage um, towards the end of this. We put signage up explaining that this is like a dat dock campground. So if you bring in rubbish, you then take the rubbish out with you. And also the only rubbish bin we had was in the Faripaku, the toilet, and that was for paper towels only, not for anything else. And that was kind of what the focus was to start off with. So without bins, there was nowhere to put the rubbish. You'd think that would be quite straightforward and easy. Um, but people would leave their rubbish in the rooms. But we had a cleaning fee attached to the booking. And so if people had a significant mess, then we could go back and say, within our terms and conditions, we are charging you for a cleaning uh, option, which includes removing rubbish. Now, I mean, that sounds kind of mean and anti-customer service, but people did really take it on board because I don't think in the four and a half years we've had the rooms, we've actually enacted that. We've only threatened that. And usually we give people a reasonable warning and say, hey, look, you left the place in a bit of a mess. And um, if you do that next time, we will enact the cleaning fee. We leave brooms in the room, vacuum cleaners um, and things like that. And the vacuum cleaners basically vacuum up the stuff that they sweep. And it's an ongoing journey for us because we learn things. Some people just leave their rubbish on the bench. We had a full kitchen with cups and saucers and plates and a fridge and a microwave and stuff and a kettle. So people could come in and feel that they could rehearse at night time and have somewhere to leave their dinner or make a cup of tea. Um, and then of course, we all know that the worldwide pandemic hit in 2020. Uh, and we took away those facilities because of the health risk of those. We've never put those back in again because we had to put signs up in the kitchen saying, we're not your parents, please clean up after you. And that was kind of, the signage was the way we kept communicating and just emailing people and letting them know and reinforcing that with signage in the rooms. Um, for those of you who have tried this before, you know it can be incredibly frustrating. Uh, but it's it's you have to be in it for the long game. It's not going to happen very quickly because people have to be re-educated uh, because venues, people are used to having rubbish bin, bins and venues where they can just chuck everything in there. And we didn't really want to sort of um, create an environment to start off with where that was how it was going to, to carry on. So by starting right at the beginning, uh, we thought we had an advantage of doing that, um, of saying, no bins, no rubbish, take it out. So four years on, uh, we we took over, um, or sorry, two years on after that, we took over another space, the third space, the middle floor in the building, we took over from the church that uh, its lease expired. And part of our lease was if it, it came up, we would take it. And so the same philosophy uh, was enacted in that, except this time we decided that we would have bins but that the bins would be very clearly marked. Now we had to have bins because we had a bar and we had food service. So it was essential that um, we had somewhere for people to place their waste when they'd finished up with uh, with their meal or with their, their drink. But the other thing was we, and I noticed someone said about uh, drink bottles and you provide glasses and drinking water. We also uh, don't provide recycling or compostable plates and cups and glasses we just provide plates and glasses because it's about 
giving them the option of reusing as opposed to recycling or composting even. We do have compost bins, obviously, for the food waste and those sorts of things. But the idea is to minimise the waste factor. And even though we have to do dishes and those sorts of things, and occasionally a glass might get broken in the theatre, the fact is, is that it does impact the amount of waste that we produce. And overall, we have very little waste. Um, on, this, on the seminar is Connie, uh, who is um, the administrator for the trust and for the venue. She may um, want to add anything in, the, um, in there about that, uh, but we can talk about that that journey. Hello, Connie. <laughs> um, it's a, it is a challenging thing to do. Once you commit to doing it, you have to commit 150%. There's no sort of middle ground. And I'll tell you a few of our earlier stories. Um, I'm going to try and share a photo. Uh, I can see the share button. Years of Zoom. Let's see if this works. Um, share a screen. Google Drive. There we go. How's that? So you can all see that, I hope. I can't see whether you can see it or not because I can't see you. But that's our bin system that we put in place. So we have soft plastic because in Auckland, uh, soft plastic is recycled. Um, and then we have recycling, actual recyclables. We have compost, which is around food waste, but also we choose products that are home compostable as well to sell in our shop. And we have general waste. We have two of these bin systems in the foyer and one behind our bar and kitchen. And they all, um, they all have these four bins. Further down in the foyer, the general waste bin is removed from the soft plastics recycling and compost bins. So we decided to put these in to the foyer um, right from the beginning. And um, that, now I've lost you all. Am I still sharing? Am I back? Uh, you're back. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> it's a little bit different from Sue. Um, we decided that, that that would be, by separating the general waste, um, that would create less of an interest in it and people would start having to read the signs. That's another story. I'll tell you a little tale of frustration early on in our journey, and that was we had a group come in, and I won't name the group, but it was a group of people who were filming something within our space and they were in for two days. And what we do with our induction, our health and safety, is we actually tell people about our bin system straight away. We let them know that these are the, um, the bin systems that we have and that um, this is how you use them. And we go through the different products and what they should and shouldn't do with our bins. When they were packing out, as part of the packing out, as we do a handover and we walk through, I went to the compost bin and inside were takeaway containers, rubbish, some tape, some tape they'd use for taping things down on the floor, all thrown into the one bin. So I went to the producer and said to them, you're going to have to sort the bins out. And they looked absolutely horrified. These were people in their early 20s who I think were part of a university group. And they didn't actually believe that I was going to say that. Um, I said it as nicely as possible, because um, as Connie will attest to, I'm a fantastic front-facing person, eh, Connie? And um, I don't get grumpy when people don't listen to our BIM system. But it is about education. And I didn't want them to just to walk away and leave and think they'd done everything right. Because if they go to another venue, who are trying to run the similar system of recycling and composting, then I think it's it's the collective ideology that works. It's if everyone, every single venue does the same thing, then that becomes a collective philosophy. And within that collective philosophy, people start to realise that it is important that they do um, they do follow those rules. Because a lot of the venues I go to, theatre venues I go to, have similar systems. They have recycling. They have compost and um, they have soft plastic. And it's very um, good for us to all to reinforce each other with those sorts of things, if that makes any sense. Anyway, continuing with this story, which some of you might find horrific, uh, they ended up upending the bins on our floor. And I would say the older people of the group and some of them were parents started sorting through the rubbish. 
And I stood there going, this doesn't make me feel comfortable in the sense that this kind of isn't how our venue's set up. We're a community arts venue to support um, emerging artists, professional emerging artists and groups that are trying to develop work as well as professional uh, performance groups. And it felt a little bit awkward, but I just stood there and let them do it. And then they started sorting and started arguing about what went where. And so I very gently pointed them to the signs that were on the wall and said, remember the signs I showed you when you came in? These are the signs that you need to adhere to. And they did actually end up sorting it and going off. It was a very, uh, it was a difficult uh, process that particular one time. But I think it was worthwhile because even if three or four of them came out of that knowing that's what we were aiming for, then at least they were educated around that. And I go back to that, it's a, always about the education and reminding people all the time. So if I go back to our, um, go back to our other signage, um, which we put up. So we have, can you see that? We have these signs and what we do, um, I can't hear you, uh, so if you can't see it, you need to send me a message. We have these signs and what we do is we identify the things that can be recycled. We can see it, Richard. Oh, fantastic. The things that can be recycled and these, I'm sorry, it's in Google Docs, but these are the things that we have, we change them. So the packaging uh, and that sort of stuff goes in our recycling bin and that's um, above the rubbish bins. We are finding that people don't tend to read the rubbish bins, which can be a little bit frustrating. Um, but again, it's in that induction pointing it out. It's more the audiences that come in. Here's our second bin station. You can see we've got the general waste bin separate from that with the other bins over here with these. And again, it's reminding the venues, uh, the venue hirers that these bin bins are in place um, for them for them to use. Um, our composting is really important to us. We have a compost bin in our car park and all our food waste and um, we have some compostable packaging. We have food um, and some of these bio breakdowns and our proper crisps, uh, our proper crisp packets actually are home compostable. So they can put those in there. So that's kind of the signage we have over the composting. And um, this sign here is in Te Reo Māori in English, which I think some people say they find confusing for road signs, but it's not a road sign. It's quite obvious because here is an international symbol about don't put anything in the bin because there are no bins. Take your rubbish with you. And that's a really important part of what we've been doing with our signage um, through this time is making sure people know to take their rubbish out. I know that... Um, uh, I know that... Um, Connie has just done a, um, an email out to people in our newsletter for the end of the year, just reminding them that uh, with photographs showing rubbish around our room and just reminding them gently that actually the idea is they do need to take that stuff out and that it is important that they follow the philosophy of our organisation and reinforcing that the reason our rates are so reasonable is because they are able to um, access them because we don't have to have staff on 24 7. And that's really a key philosophy of keeping our prices down. Connie's typing something. I um, Social media and internal reminders are a big part of our zero waste journey. That's really, really important fact. We remind people in our social media um, and that's something that we really like to do. Sorry, can you see me on camera or can you see that the static? We can see the camera. You can. <laughs> Apologies, everyone. It's a new format for me, so I'm not sure. I can see this other thing on this side here. Yeah. Um, the, um, the other thing around that with social media messaging, it's, it's around un people understanding why we do it. It's not just please put your rubbish in the recycling or your rubbish in the bin or recycling in the recycling bin or the compost or it's actually understanding the philosophy about it. And people understand money. And one of the reasons we get 
um, the hireage of, of a lot of the arts organisations is because we're accessible for many different reasons, one of them being the cost. So reminding them the cost is a factor in this uh, and that they're invested in this themselves about keeping it lower cost, I think is a really important aspect of, um, of how we communicate that. And um, so when Connie puts out messaging in our newsletter and in our social media, that's a lot of what it is that we talk about, how we can keep that down. And one of our signs actually says, help keep the costs down um, here, keep these accessible for you in order to um, make it accessible 24 seven. Because if we did have to have a staff member on here, and many of you know, I mean, our first highest cost is our salaries for our staff. Second is our lease. So if we had to have, um, if we had to have, yes, I can share that. If we had to have um, staff here all the time, because we sometimes we've got people here at eight in the morning and people here at midnight, and we've had people come in and because we're 24 seven at 4 a.m which is you know, what we like, because it actually keeps the venue safe because there are people around, but they need to adhere to those kind of basic rules we have about locking doors, sweeping up after they're finished and, and those sorts of things. I'll just find that, um, that signage. This is it here. Please help keep Kiti Aranui affordable to our arts community. We are a zero waste facility like a dock campground. What you bring in, you need to take out. There are no rubbish bins here for your rubbish, so take it with you. Any bins are here for specific purpose, so please do not put your rubbish in them. Keep our staff safe. We thank you for your cooperation. And keeping our staff safe is also another message that we have been talking about, because it's particularly during COVID, it was about, um, it was very much about that. Um, that our our um, staff having to reach into bins and the toilets and things to clear stuff out, it just wasn't ideal for us to do that. Um, so we, how to procure sustainability? Well, what we had to look at is things like, now we've got the compost bin, can we compost the towels? How do we transfer those in? We looked at getting, um, I'm, how do I get out of this? Confirm, there we go. We looked at how do we actually um, create a space that makes it easy for people. And choosing toilet rolls, cleaning products that are best for the environment. We have cleaners coming in for us. Um, we use a firm where we've asked for eco-friendly products. And that was part of the pitch that they gave us. Um, and also, We've asked them um, about the products that they use, but also we get the paper towels in uh, because looking at, shout out to the Eco Pro Cleaning Company. Uh, thank you, Connie. I knew that they had Eco in the name. The um, uh, Connie's amazing. I just asked if you're running a venue, get yourself a Connie. Um, I'm selling clones uh, for about $40,000. Um, no, joking. The thing with the compost bin too is that um, we're not using the compost at the moment for gardening or anything like that. We haven't got vegetable gardens for our cafe, which would be ideal when our cafe gets up and running. But at the moment, it's just breaking it down in the environment. So potentially we have more options around composting paper towels and those sorts of things. But the other thing around that is that um, you can actually get deliveries of pull down towels, but looking into that, realizing that they get almost dry cleaned with a huge impact on the environment. So those pull down towels that things like uh, towel services and that provide actually aren't that environmentally friendly. It's better to get things that break down, uh, whether it be in the landfill or in a composting system, rather than getting things that use incredible little amounts of um, chemicals to wash and dry things, almost like dry cleaning and those sorts of things. And why they might be more convenient and less rubbish producing this waste. It's what you do with the waste that's that product. And as I say, this is an ongoing journey. So we keep learning every time we have a new group in, we learn something about what we're not saying in our induction uh, or what we need to add. 
or are we actually, is our signage good enough? And the other day I actually happened to be at the Auckland Zoological Park and saw the bins that they had there. And when they are way better than our bins because they're bright red, bright green, and bright blue and quite big and very clear about what goes in them. And I think that's the secret about this is making it, making sure that the signage is very clear and that you're talking to people all the time about it. If they come up to the bar and they get a packet of proper crisps with home compostable packaging, we say, when you're finished with it, this packet goes in the compost bin, not in the rubbish or the recycling because actually compostable packaging interferes with the recycling process I know in the Auckland city region recycling. Um, Bree, my hires keep removing all my signage. I've got a solution to that. We got funding um, to get security cameras in our venue, mainly to keep our, our users 24 seven safe because a lot of our users are young women and so we got funding for security cameras and all sorts of things go wrong. We had some people jamming a hat in our door to keep it open. That was open all night and they were jamming a hat in there and that was actually causing it to be unsafe for other users in our rooms. So we can go through um, with the cameras and identify who's doing that, who left that there, who was last to access and those sorts of things. Um, Cameras are a good way to do it. If they're taking signage down, uh, we have a policy around banning people who don't follow our rules. And I'm pretty sure we haven't banned anyone yet. Connor, you could confirm that. Because generally what it takes is a conversation. And if somebody does something once, then the conversation and not, I'm quite happy to have the hard conversation one person ages ago, fantastic. And probably it was me talking to them because Connie, Connie and I are a little bit good cop, bad cop. And of course, Connie's the good cop. She's lovely with people, uh, talking to people and telling them about the venue and um, doing the bookings. And, and if things go wrong, she addresses it very well. I just go in, if I see the door jammed open or if I see something that's just really clearly not supposed to happen, I'll go in and say something. I'll introduce myself explain why I'm talking to them and say our philosophy is if you keep doing that, we just won't approve your bookings within our venue because it's not just about them. It's about all the other users in the venue. And if everyone else makes the effort to do it, then it's reasonable to expect that other people should follow suit on that. I've been a rule breaker all my life, but I think it's a matter of changing the attitude around that. There are rules, I think, that need to be broken. But actually when you were talking about people keeping people safe, keeping people healthy, I think there are rules that need to stay in place. And our rules are not unreasonable and we have very few of them. Take your rubbish away, don't jam the door open, just keep it nice for the person who comes in next. And that's, I think, something that as a lot of venues try and do, stack the chairs, put things away. And we all know that people don't always do that and for various reasons. Um, but generally I find probably 90% of the people would adhere to the rules um, most of the time. I've been in a few times expecting to find chaos in the morning and um, that um, that doesn't happen. I'm pleasantly surprised a lot of the time to go in and see chairs are stacked. There's no rubbish. There might be the odd drink bottle, which can be recycled, sitting up on the bench. I can deal with that because that's when we've got 15 groups in on a Sunday rotating through five rooms. If we have one drink bottle, then we're, we're doing well. The message is getting through. The Eco Company, more expensive than normal cleaner. We got quotes in, Ian, about that. And um, we specifically asked for Eco uh, products and things. I don't think they're any more expensive. In fact, we reduced, we got a reduction in price because we changed how we did the cleaning. They cost us around $700 a month, um, I believe. It depends on how often you're getting your venue cleaned. Because of how we operate with the zero waste, we get a deep clean once a week. And that's kind of how it works. Um, and 
we clean like my office and that I just clean myself if I have to. Um, and the theatre isn't being used 24 seven. So it gets cleaned, deep cleaned once a fortnight. Or if we have a venue and we can do a special clean, but our staff also afterwards go through and clean the venue as well around the bar and the foyer. So the job of Eco Pro in our facility is to do the deep clean uh, on that weekly basis, clean the mirrors, mop the floors, the windows and those sorts of things. So again, it comes down to what your venue requires. Worth having a conversation for with, um, I think Stefan is the name of the guy that uh, we deal with at EcoPro. Um, but it, I mean, it's always best just to get a couple of quotes to see, depending on what your bespoke uh, bespoke needs are. I don't know if I've talked enough, if I've explained enough, or if there are any, um, any other questions around what we do. I think the biggest thing is you've got to commit and that's it. And you've got to deal with the frustration uh, sometimes uh, suck it up and go, well, this is what we've decided to do. And I think any other venue will tell you the same thing who's gone down this journey. It's really frustrating to begin with. But as you keep educating people, it's just like the whole thing of signs up and we'll all know this. Do not put anything down the toilet except toilet paper. I don't know how many of you have got signs like that up. But in the beginning, we had the plumber in probably once every four or five weeks as people put paper towels, tampons, and even, yes, an apricot stone down the toilet because it was found in the pump because we have a pump system for our toilet downstairs. Can you please train my kids? Um, my kids can probably train your kids because they've grown up, <laughs> they've grown up with that. And, um, oh, Connie's there, I'll read this out. Connie said, I would also add that there's been a big shift globally towards understanding that we will all need to work towards reducing our waste for the impact we're having on the climate. It's a very good point. The market has been flooded, and I, we mean this in a good way, with eco-friendly products and services. It just takes a bit more investigation. And for our venue, we spend more money on rubbish bags, but they compost in our outdoor bin, which is something that we are committed to. And that's really true. I mean, the composting bins that we get are your domestic ones um, through, I can't remember the supply, Eco Bags, I think is the name of the company. And they'll deliver them to your venue. They come in all different sizes and shapes. You can get big, massive ones for your outdoor bins and little ones for the bins under the desk. Eco Pack, thank you, Connie. Um, <laughs> where do you purchase a Connie? Go on and advertise uh, and name the skill set that you want. That's what I'd say. Um, but it's it's very much those sorts of things. What bin, bin liners do we use? I mean, that's something I hadn't mentioned. What bin liners do we use? And actually now, after the floods in Auckland, those of you who are not in Auckland in New Zealand, we had massive floods here in um, February this year. Our venue closed for eight weeks. Well, they had to rebuild about 600 down with all the floodwaters and stuff. We got a refurbished venue, which was kind of good. Thank you, insurance company. But that's the sort of thing we're now facing is the climate crisis and how do we reduce that? People are understanding it. And depending on your demographic, I think you'll find that the younger generation understand that more, are having more conversations and are accepting of the kaupapa or the philosophy of uh, eco-friendly, environmentally friendly uh, things. One thing I will point out is in searching for cleaners and products is greenwash. There is greenwash that happens. Um, and so you've just got to make sure that the companies that are providing you with those services actually are doing what they say they're doing. They're recycling, they're composting, but their products can compost domestically because a lot of products say um, compostable or biodegradable. Everything is biodegradable. This is something I've learned on my journey. But some things take 400 years to biodegrade. So by saying biodegradable, they're not lying. They're not breaching the Consumer Act. But they don't say it's biodegradable by 2,472. So that's just something to be aware of as well. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Like, I've also learned so much. I've just been writing notes, like the practicalities that you've shared and the tips that you've also, like when you guys started your journey, 
I think the biggest thing for me was the fact that you said you really utilize all forms of communication to really educate and share the philosophy, not just to like one person, but to the community as well, you know, that shared philosophy. Um, and I think like I stand with you on that and just being firm about your rules and regulations. I feel like a lot of people who work in community venues feel like because they are for the community, like you always need to bend over backwards for what the community wants. But at the end of the day, it's about respect and about being good stewards of the space and the people who run and also use the space. And so I think once you guys set the standard, it's like people just will learn. And usually they're pretty old with, with like complying with the rules that you have. Um, I did have a question. Like you did mention you've been zero waste for four years now. Um, when you started, did you feel like people jumped into the change immediately or did it take some time? And when it did, how long did you notice until the, the well, your customers got used to it? Because we were a new venue, yeah. uh, we really have nothing to benchmark it against. Yeah. It's just the way we started. There are no rubbish bins. Mm. So people just had to accept that. Um, it's an ongoing journey. It depends because we have new users all the time. So that education has to continue. The signage has to stay up. Um, the conversations have to happen. The social media has to go out. The reminders and the newsletters and those sorts of things. So um, people are pretty good to adapt when they understand why you're doing it. And I, it, it'll, the journey never ends. So it's not like, yay, we're zero waste. And um, we and so let's that term zero waste is is aspirational, because we still do produce theatre and film industry, is one of the hugest um, uh, purveyors of, of waste in in New Zealand. There's so much waste. So every time we look at what we've got, we're wondering how can we reuse this? Can this go somewhere else? We've got a wonderful recycling facility here in Unihunga. Um, we want to recycle all the technology that we have. I'm reticent to chuck anything in the bin. But our, our, our um, funnily enough, our, our general waste, when we put the bins out every week for them to be collected, if I ever put the general waste bin out and I open it up, most of the waste, because our bins are outside, comes from people walking past. It's not from the venue. So we've got lockable a lockable box to put our bins in to stop that happening. But they'll find another bin to put it in. So, um, but within our, our venue, there because of the products we buy and how we, uh, how we run it, there is very, very little general waste that goes there. Would you agree, agree with that, Connie? Um, that's my assessment of it. Um, and that we work really hard to, mm -hmm. and we won't allow, so there's another thing. No confetti, no balloons. We don't allow balloons in the venue because single-use balloons straight into the environment. We've got the ocean just over there. Seabirds, fish, uh, when balloons end up in our seawater, they end up choking and killing birds and, and, and sea life. So, uh, and we just, um, yeah, random rubbish. You make it into the bins, yes. Um, and also... Um, you know, people bring in takeaway containers and those sorts of things. They throw away, you know, those sushi, um, uh, what do you call them, the soy sauce packets and things like that. I've been known to take them out and rinse them and take them home and put them aside because we'll use them at home and I'll recycle the soft plastic rather than just ending up and spending a thousand years breaking down in the, mm -hmm. in the landfill. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the kind of commitment you have to have. My children eat a lot of sushi, so it works out quite well. And when I go to St. Pierre's, I say, no, soy sauce, I've got enough at home. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was also wondering, like, um, it might be hard for you to, like, but if you have any, like, reflection or tips on this one, but if a community venue were to start, like, their journey, like, um, maybe doing simple things for now and then later on wanting to do to the extent of Kete Anarnui, how would you feel like, how do you measure success? Like, I, I know it's still a journey and they people will probably learn that uh, over the years that it's like, okay, this is something we do and something we don't do. But how would you share, like, how you guys measured success in terms of like, oh, we're on the right track? 
you did mention like, oh, one water bottle out of 15 groups, you know, we're doing something right. But how else do you feel? Well, if the, if the general waste bin has that much rubbish in the bottom at the end of a week, keep the pie, that's good. That's that success. If people um, who are using our venue in the theatre follow the rules around the, uh, the bins, that's another measure of success. If we go into the bins at the end of a show and don't have to sort, that's great. Now that's a measure of success, people learning. Um, our compost bin being full, that's great. As long as it's full with compost, um, that's that's a measure of success. Uh, it depends on what, you know, what your goals are for your venue. It really does. Um, our measures might be different from your measures, but it's really about just persisting, you know, um, making that decision that that's what you're going to do and persisting with it. And seeing a reduction in waste or more recycling coming in or people bringing in fewer things from outside because that's another thing if they bring them in they have to take them out and less uh, fewer conflicts with people over what they're putting into bins those sorts of things are really important measures i think um fewer newsletter articles about leaving rooms in a state so that's yeah yeah awesome um, if uh, the chat doesn't have any other questions, but if the audience still has any, this is your last chance to ask it for Richard. Um, one of the other questions that I have is you've shared a lot about um, what you guys have done. Do you have any tips on what not to do to get you started that you guys have experienced in your journey? Don't put bins in the rooms. Yeah. Don't, as what I'd say, don't start, you know, just take the bins out and put up very clear signage mm -hmm. um, because they've got nowhere to put it. And, I, and, and this came from about 10 years ago, I was working, I had a contract with an advertising agency and they removed all the bins out of their office and put a little box on everyone's desk and said, that's your, now your rubbish bin. Mm -hmm. And there's the recycling and there's the compost. And it made a huge difference because people just didn't chuck stuff in the bin anymore. They actually had to think about it. If they only got that much every week, then they think about what are oh, this banana peel i'll throw that in the recycling uh, i'm in the compost rather than putting it into my big bin which is sitting next to me yeah um if you need to get a clean done following a booking would you just charge that as an extra item or take it out of their bond we don't charge a bond isn't that interesting um we don't charge a bond because of how we operate we charge so we have the add-ons um, but it says in their terms and conditions that we will charge a cleaning fee if it's beyond a mess. Mm -hmm. If I have to go down and mop the floor, I'm going to charge them because that's my time. And I should be running seminars, not mopping the floor. <laughs> so um, that's kind of, you know, how our thinking goes, Ian. Um, but definitely it's an extra item. Uh, if you take a bond, if we took a bond and someone left a mess, I'd actually probably be more inclined to take it out of a bond because we've already got the money rather than chasing them for it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be that venue that's always, because that means that somewhere along the line, our comms aren't working. So if, it, if it's happening a lot of the time, it's probably an opportunity to look at your own communication with your users and say, the message isn't getting through. What do we need to do to shift our communication rather than people aren't listening to us? because that's really what it comes down to. The responsibility, if you want to be zero waste, really does fall on the venue to make the effort to educate and communicate and demonstrate mm -hmm. what you're doing, as opposed to just relying on people knowing, because they don't. And this is a worldwide thing. People are learning about this all the time. So it, going back to that, we've charged the bond once in four and a half years. That uh, the um, sorry the cleaning fee in four and a half years. Oh. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, thank you so much for your time and just sharing your journey with Ketera Nui. Um, it has been so valuable, and the chat has just been nonstop, and at least the humor as well with Connie being for sale. Um, when she's up for sale, do let us know, and we'll send the email out to everyone. <laughs> but. Um, Again, so oh, funny. he's a contractor now. <laughs> um, 
But we hope that this has really inspired everybody who um, is watching to do something, even something small, to just start their own journey in the community venue or even in your own homes yeah. to start being zero waste. Again, like um, Richard said, it's not you just call yourself zero waste. It's an aspiration. It's ongoing and it is a journey. And we hope that the journey for you will also be quite fulfilling and beneficial for your community. Um, Richard has mentioned in Katiaro Nui that they also have um, pin codes. Um, for those of you who are space to co-hosts, we actually have um, keyless entry, which is the same as what Richard, how Katiaro Nui operates. If you are interested, I sent a link on the chat, but we will also send that in the emails um, post this um, webinar. Um, and we just wanted to invite everybody who hasn't been a part of it yet, the Community Venues Facebook page. We will send the access to this through the email. Um, and just to say again, thank you everyone for tuning in to our last CVLS. We will see you in 2024 with a lot more topics, a lot more speakers. And we hope, this is quite early, but we hope that you have a great Christmas.